Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome to a special episode of Creative Happy Hour, Creative Conversations. Today, we're having a creative conversation with Linda Cosgrove, a fine artist who is a very good friend of the podcast, a great supporter, and somebody that we admire <laughs> for her amazing artistic ability. And we're going to be talking today about history of little Linda, how she discovered her processes. Calling, processes, and how to value yourself as an artist, going from a general creative to a fine artist honing your craft, being an everyday working artist, the difference between the amateur and the professional, mm -hmm. and a, a bunch of stuff besides, and we'll be de deconstructing a few of Linda's paintings that kind of mark these seminal turning points in her style. <laughs> So we're great fans, we're great collectors. We're drinking Chardonnay. Chardonnay. Upon Linda's request, uh, <laughs> Linda likes to drink Chard. So we're going to say cheers to that. And we're going to start asking you. Cheers. 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 What is it, baby, about the Chardonnay that we like? When I first moved to San Francisco, mm -hmm. prior to that, all I did was drink reds. Once I got to San Francisco, it was an era late 70s, there were huge parties everywhere, Ooh. and no one served red wine. Oh so you have a party, seriously? You'd have a party awesome. of like 80 people, the word would just go out, and you know, there'd be like yeah. two, three a week. Oh, wow. Nice. And so oh, I either drank Chardonnay, Chardonnay or Chardonnay. I didn't drink. So, oh. so that started it, and I have not turned back. I love it. I love Except it. when wow. I'm visiting in Italy, and then it's it's Pinot red Regional? wine all the oh, time. Oh, red wine. Okay. And the, and the Italians are very basic. Mm -hmm. They're not the wine snobs that we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And or not. I'm not a wine snob, but the, <laughs> that snobbery doesn't exist. If, and yeah. if it is there, well, the, there's if they're the serving wine culture as well in Europe, yes. right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if they are serving a wonderful wine, it's not really particularly discussed. Right. Oh, see, whereas we're total snobs here in California, and you know we're like, yeah, as well like, we should we, be. We do quantity and quality. And, and I'm an oak person. Yeah, yeah. You and like I'm an oak. oak yeah. Person. And well, <laughs> when I have a Chardonnay, I have to say that I really like the oaky, buttery butter bombs. Right. I think there's a time and the place for the big old Rombauer or something like oh, that. Oh my god. Right. The best. Right. There are moments for that. We like it. You drink a Chardonnay that's called butter, don't you? Yes. That you like, and that's descriptive. I love that. Yeah. Um, and this one is a French Chardonnay that you brought us today. Mm -hmm. So shocking. I love French. It's, right. It's a little bit French less wine. giant and sunny, and but it's really lovely. I actually like this one. Yeah, yeah they're more lot. simple. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the Chardonnays are, I kind of feel like they're, they're heavy bodied. To me, they're kind of yeah. like drinking dessert. Like you don't, I don't really think of yeah. eating. Maybe like cheese and crackers or something. I think something. it's a good, yeah, I think it's a good it's like rich. happy hour. Well, it's a good yeah. happy hour wine just because if you're not going to be eating. Yeah, you can just have a glass of wine and yeah. it's, just, it's yeah. kind of its own thing. Right? I like to pair this with, you know, those Italian, speaking of olives, the green Italian olives. Mm -hmm. The Serignola, is that what they're called? And they have that buttery flavor to mm, them. And I, I love those. And they pair perfectly yeah. with this Chardonnay. So, and you brought this. We feel so bad. We host Linda and she brings us the Chardonnay. <laughs> Which is awesome. I, I know. Love, we are, yeah. yeah we we love are starving like artists over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we're not starving. We're not thirsty, at least. Yeah. So, <laughs> and we think, you know, if any of you want to be a guest and have a creative conversation, yes. especially if you bring your own booze, we are we're, all You're welcome. They love you. Yeah. They'll love yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just come I mean, on over. It's great. So we're going to start with a little bit of biographical information. Micah mm -hmm. had a lot of questions. I mean, I know you very, very well, so I know a lot of this, but I think our listeners and viewers are going to love to hear what happened? So you've got yeah. So your I guess uh, you know I was thinking about I know you kind of where you are in your life now, but I don't really have a reference for where you came from and how you were nurtured as a child and how that affected your creative life. Were you were you creative as a child, or were your parents creative? Were you around it? That kind of stuff. So my father was an officer in um, military intelligence, which is a very restrictive kind of a world. And he was exactly the opposite. So uh -huh. what he would do on the weekends, he would make us puppets or um, Pacino dolls, or he would he would go on these cooking binges with his friends. He he was and an he had incredibly, a lot of friends, right? he, yeah, he was an incredibly creative person. Mm -hmm. And as a military officer, 
once we were had moved to Japan, we had always lived in cities. We never lived on bases, so I never considered myself an Air Force brat. Mm. But in Japan, you had to live off base. And oh. um, his friends were, he, he had, and, and it's much more insular. It's mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. you know, when we were mm -hmm. with the Pentagon, it was Washington, D.C. I mean, it was, you know, we were in Fairfax, Virginia. In Japan, I was very well aware of who his friends were, who were military, and it was a black lieutenant, a gay lieutenant, a staff sergeant, a waiter in a Chinese restaurant. He was he was <laughs> a Japanese waiter. I mean, yeah, he was he was amazing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so his father was a photographer. He was a photographer. Oh. His brother was a photographer. So wow. his father had a photographic studio. Um, and and my father had done commercial work for Oscar Mayer or whatever when he got back into the military with the Korean War. Anyway, so surrounded by all that. Um, and was your mother as, artistic as well? She actually could draw. Oh, you know, when you're little and you go up to your parents and you go, Mommy, draw a picture. She could do a <laughs> she could. pretty decent she job. My it. father did a really good job. I remember crashing disappointment on my end when I'd say, like, draw the <laughs> yeah. picture. Like, I don't remember any of that going on in my no, household no. either. That's amazing. So then, um, you know, when you're growing up, you're the one person that the teacher takes aside and says, it's Christmas, do the illustration on the blackboard for Christmas and mm. I'm in the sixth grade or my drawing would be the one that would be kind of held up, you know, it was still like a circle for a tree. And, but, but essentially I had a see, sense. Yeah. They started myself. to see some, that you had some spatial awareness. Then being as we're not in an era at this point where anyone really cares where you're going to college, et cetera. Right. The <laughs> minute like I knew I could have an arts degree, which meant I didn't have to take math in college, I was like, <laughs> I'm getting my arts degree. Oh. So I got a fine art degree. Which is great. I mean, that's so lucky because I really feel, how did your parents feel about the arts degree? I mean, I know you're done Number one, my father was gone. Yes. The other, my mother was teaching at the University of Wisconsin and she was left with me because her husband was dead. My sister was in college and I was sort of her main focus point. So I'd be the one that would be asked, what do you want for dinner? Do you want lamb chops? Do you want whatever? I So she wanted you piece. to do what you wanted. She yeah. just wanted my happiness. So, so there was never, there was never any, you know, why are you doing this? Or, See, I think that's a really great thought it out. That's, that's a great thing for our creatives out there yeah. who have kids who want to be creative. Is I know that you know both I'm of us. I'm very have much kids. like that with yeah. my daughter, and we want to encourage them in their creativity because yeah. we see what that yields. We see the frustrated creatives yes. that are kind of here, where you know, yes, we're creative every day, but we haven't attained that level of achievement because I think that there wasn't the support from the get-go. I think that there's a huge advantage. Yeah, there is. Happen. There is. And I mean, of course, there is the natural ability, which yeah, you, you have clearly to have. You have dress. to have some ability. But, yeah, but I think that that helps to have somebody telling you, I want you to be happy. What makes you happy? Is it going to art school? You go for it. But you've often said also about the art school that you learned a lot in art school, but then you taught yourself a lot of your techniques. So how did that work? How did that kind of come about? It, what I'll say to people is essentially within our system, you know, the American university collegiate system, you get no instruction for anything that isn't technical. So they'll teach you how to mm -hmm. solder. They'll teach you how to, uh, you know, do centrifugal loss wasp process for jewelry they will so the super technical stuff they'll teach you that mm -hmm. but as far as painting goes no one teaches you anything what they do it's the laziest profession in the world they send you home they tell you mm -hmm. paint in acrylic put your feelings on paper well you're 18 yeah. you're 19 right and you'll have a critique but no instruction is what you're saying no you're getting yeah. no instruction so i didn't what you're what you're hearkening back to mm -hmm. is my having told you mm -hmm. that i came out of the university system with a fine arts degree having gone to two different schools you know, south carolina and wisconsin and madison without being taught anything mm -hmm. and there is a huge upside to that yes which we well, have yeah, discussed because you have developed your own 
style, which is so unique. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later because it's fascinating. We're actually going to put up a bunch of Linda's paintings. So if you're watching the video, you get that right away. If you're not watching the video, subscribe for sure. Go check us out on Instagram because we will be posting Linda's paintings along with a description of, you know, what it means and everything. And then you can kind of compare those to what you hear on the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to your podcast. I have a quick question about the art school. Did they teach you how to be a creative and an artist in a general sense? Or is that something that you also had to develop on your own? Anyone who puts themselves in a university or college art program, you sort of identify yourself as different from everyone else. Mm -hmm. It's usually a teeny tiny little group of people. Uh -huh. I, oddly enough, and my daughter, who's artistic and so similar to, she's gotten talent from both her mother and her father. Very much so, she's, which is nice to see. She also was just like me. I did not want to hang around with the art. Group. Well, your daughter's oh, a jock, and I think, but I guess both I of you are a jock. jock uh, but, yeah. Well, your husband's a jock, yeah, very much. But, yeah. You know, <laughs> I just, I, I, but, but you're the one walking around on campus with the big portfolio, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. So, so you feel like you're kind of cool anyway, uh -huh. and uh -huh. and just by virtue of the fact that, um, it's such a it's such a personal thing. You don't, you're not following. Uh, you know, you're not having tests. You're mm -hmm. not, right. you know, just really. So you didn't feel like hanging out with the, the other art students? I mean, it seems like all. you, I mean, knowing the little bit that I know about you, I mean, it sounds like you did end up hanging out with all kinds of artists later on. Yes. Want more like established artists. Well, you, when, once, once you find yourself, like I did in an area of San Francisco mm -hmm. at a certain place in time where it is, magical because everyone's very relaxed it's a teeny tiny little place mm -hmm. so much was was being done here musically mm -hmm. and different from LA where people care about you know what you look like what you drive in San Francisco nobody gave a shit so can you tell us more about that time because you had a really extraordinary experience when you arrived in San Francisco as a newly minted or almost newly minted art graduate, a creative. So when you got to San Francisco, what were the projects you were working on and who were the people that you were hanging out with? So I made the connection to come to San Francisco to study under a artist that was well-established on the West Coast by my then, my sister's then boyfriend who mm -hmm. was based on the East Coast. It was mm -hmm. visionary art and it was to work with him. Mm -hmm. He had no idea that was a plan until I showed up <laughs> on his doorstep yes. saying, where am I going to be working? He thought yeah, I was going to take... That's what a creative will do. Yeah. He thought I was going to be you taking college courses. the wine. You brought the Chardonnay. Yeah. No, like, no, 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 Chardonnay. no, 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 no. That guy terrified me. But anyway, oh. so he just figured it out within about an hour and said, I think there's room in the basement for you. It was a teeny tiny little place in Woodacre, which is a tiny little sort of... Um, uh, you know, they probably were taking down trees as an industry. And it's still then. a very, yeah. very creative community because right. I have a lot of close friends that live in Woodacre and there are oh. so many creative people Interesting. in Woodacre. So Once, I end up yeah. living in San Francisco, found an apartment, and I'm commuting the opposite direction yeah, of a trees. commute, going yeah. to Woodacre to every wood, day. Wood, Woodacre, so the wood. <laughs> and I did that for three months and it was the the most wonderful thing for me was to come from an established East Coast and the Midwest, but that kind of an environment with a with a boyfriend who was three years older, with a sister that was three years older, and then finding myself, I wasn't anybody's girlfriend, I wasn't anybody's sister, I was myself, and I could have anyone I wanted as a friend, and my best friend became, was gay, and it was just so, it was so different. There weren't people who were in the junior league. You told there me you started weren't. to breathe when you came out west, that yeah. you actually like could breathe. Yeah, we more talked about that for Virginia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we had um, that conversation. You know, you, you really have a freedom of mm -hmm. self here. And as a result, you know, it's a very, it's a very arrested adolescent. Mm -hmm. Bit of 
but a fun being, arrested. Being, but a fun awesome. arrested. <laughs> well, tell us some about some uh, something about your creative community in that time. Who were some of the well, because, people that because you hung to be out able with? to. Uh, so when I came out and I stopped, not came out, but when I came mm -hmm. out to San she Francisco. We're not out. judging if you did. Yeah. If I, it's I, fine. We don't no, care. It's okay. Um, <laughs> when I moved here, and you know the the. I also had to make a living. So I was designing jewelry, private commissions. I did a line of jewelry that Neiman Marcus picked up. Um, Which is but I wasn't a business That's person. Just out of control. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't a business person. And I didn't realize that once Neiman Marcus picked it up, I also had to find out if they needed more. And uh, I was just kind of waiting for them to call me. Right. You're just like, oh, yeah. But anyway, oh so gosh, as so I'm funny. doing the jewelry, I also... No, I'm around all these bizarre, interesting people, but how do you meet people? So I thought, I'm going to find a really fabulous restaurant and hostess there. So I landed on the Trident. And so if anyone oh, wants wow. to bother with the Trident. In Sausalito, right? In yes. Sausalito. So this, let me just interrupt for a millisecond, because for our creatives out there, Linda's saying something that's really useful. Yeah. We have talked about this before. How do you make a living as a creative and in something that's going to make you money, mm -hmm. but further your career? And sometimes it's something very surprising, like hostessing in a place that you, like, that's a great job. You're meeting people left, right, and center. It doesn't take that much mental energy. It doesn't, you Yeah, know, you can conserve that for your creative work. Well, yeah, also, everyone who walked through the door was had to connect with me. Yes. Mm -hmm. I didn't yes. have to serve them. Right. It was, I used to laugh and say it was the longest cocktail party ever. Because <laughs> I drank brilliant. my way through being a hostess. It's brilliant. And yeah. Yeah. as a result, I met a, it, between that and, the North Beach Leather crew. I don't know if anybody remembers North Beach yes, Leathers. Yes, yes, yes. That's how I met John Matuzak. Oh. He, he came to because remember we were having parties of you know sixty people in a in a twelve hundred foot apartment right. kind of thing. Right. So that's how I met Boz Skaggs. That's how I you know just a tremendous amount of people. Um, Hunter, Hunter. Okay, so. Did the hostess and thing she's for talking a about while. Hunter Thompson when she says Hunter, by the yeah. way. Yeah. We're just gonna did that for a while. Put that out there. <laughs> did that for a while. <laughs> left, left that. And then again, another fallow part in my life where I was like, I'm not going out with anyone. What am I gonna do? And I got I had then at that point come to the end of my relationship with Boz Skaggs. And and so I started hostessing at his brand new restaurant. And that's how I met Hunter Thompson. Oh. And then that started a whole relationship and history, and um, yeah, it it covered does, years. Yeah, but that's that's incredibly fascinating. So when you were, so these are two artistic people we're talking about, and we and nobody cared about anything. Right. I mean, Boz came to my apartment and went, "Who decorated your apartment?" And I'm looking at him like, "You have got to be crazy." <laughs> <laughs> he and Carmela at the time were using decorators and. My apartment did not look like it was decorated. Okay, but anything. now if you go to Linda's house and if we it, can find a picture, I will show it because yeah, Linda it's like a museum. It's like a museum of really cool things that Linda has collected. Yeah, over everything the years. except for the furniture I sit on. I try to have everything done by hand. Yeah, it's and incredible. and hopefully. 18th century and earlier. Yeah, it's a very soulful collection of objects that are super important and incredible, and they're tied together by the passion that you. Well, put I think into about who, them. who, who carved that, who mm -hmm. made that, yeah. who, who painted that porcelain. You know, it's just it's fascinating to it me. It is fascinating. Yeah, and that's another lesson that is if you know if you're making things that are beautifully done, somebody's going to care. It maybe they're not going to care soon enough for you to actually live exactly. from it, but somebody's going to care down the road. I mean, nobody's ever going to care about a glass from IKEA, but you know that handmade object really does have magic to it, and it I does. think your home reflects that. And I think that just even collecting things that you're passionate about, and obviously you have an incredible aesthetic, and it, it shines. And I'm sure that your apartment back in the day in San Francisco probably had, had the same a little yeah. feeling of that. I am sure back then yeah. I had the big 
neon martini glass in the I dining room. I love it. I love it. I can't imagine. I had the Barbie that. doll sort of scene set up. No, well, it, was, it was quirky. Because you did yeah. Barbie doll jewelry. The jewelry, yes. yes. So that's, Of course you did. Yes, Barbie that's doll jewelry. Yes. That was a whole nother story. That was a whole nother yeah. story. So, well, let's talk about that. So you were making jewelry and you were hanging out with these creative people and, you know, having this fun life. When did you pivot from so what I was doing was, to the artist? So, so this is back when I think artists tend to feel like they, sh especially young and mature artists, that they need to work in the evenings. They need to work at night. They need to work. Well, it's you know, the mistake. Like it's the lifestyle. Three in the morning. I'm right. also a night owl. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that. Well, I would I would work from colored pencil because I do have the ability to draw. Okay. And well, what you'll see what we're talking about. We're posting some yeah. paintings. So I was always a incredible. standout in the college, etc., mm -hmm. because of the ability I had to to draw. Mm -hmm. And and different from my daughter, my husband, I have to look at something to be able to draw it. They don't. My well, father you're able did to recreate have things to, perfectly when you. Look yeah, at them. yeah, but I mean, yeah. you know, that's my version. That's mm -hmm. my limitations. Happily. I don't see that limitation happening in my daughter. So mm -hmm. I think she's got the both, best of both of us. So I would do colored pencil. And someone, you know, you, you have these things that are told to you that stand out. And one of the, one of the creatives that I worked with was mm -hmm. a guy that, his name was the Crazy Arab. And he was oh, part yeah, of Crazy, Arab. crazy <laughs> Shirts. And he was also very close to Stanley Mouse who did the Grateful Dead posters. Uh -huh. Not so much Kelly, but definitely Stanley Mouth. So I am now fully immersed in this bizarre West Coast poster. Can we stuff. just interject as well that you happen to be on the cover of the Eagles Hotel California? Inside the cover. Inside the cover. Yeah. The, oh, sorry. The cover inside of the cover. Hotel did California. You know, oh, yeah. Just inside the cover. Did you know uh, Moscoso, what's, uh, what the guy that did the poster? Um, I, know I dated his about. son. I dated his son, Husto Moscoso, and so I got to meet his father, oh. Victor. Yeah, Victor no, Moscoso. I never met him, but the, those names and were all floating around. Yeah, wow. yeah, and that's where I met. Yeah, okay. lots of. I mean, here I am, just. But he's a famous poster so, artist of that time. So one of the things that Arab had said to me was, "Draw what. Draw what you know. Draw what you're looking at." So you know, I I still have it. I did a colored pencil of my feet in socks on my bed with a Balthus book next to it. I did a good job. I'm sure but, you I did. Mean, you know, so very anyway, so I was go. doing yeah. these. Very Balthus, actually, it's not very Balthus of her, actually. <laughs> very Balthus. So, so I'd switch from colored pencil, then I'd go to, I was doing acrylic, then colored pencil, then Arab tried to get me into airbrush because that's what all those oh, artists yeah. were well, doing was airbrush. That, yeah. that put what them about under the pastel? Ground, did too. you ever work with yes. pastel? Then I went to pastel. I love pastels. Yeah, that's that, my thing. You've that with you can be very too. painterly with pastel, right? Yes. And it was very, very messy. Very yes. messy. That's the only. Very messy. Thing. That's the only downside. Nice and disgusting. Yeah. No, I but you some... can use the oil ones, and you can blend all this cool stuff and bleed mm -hmm. stuff into it. No, that was that was my last move before then. For the I paint. started the oil paint. Did you start? Oh, so and yeah, so Linda now works exclusively in oils. Right. Did you start right away on the copper? Or did you? No, start no, 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 no. Oh, Couple was way later. That was way later. So okay. at this point now, I've I've moved on past my young, uh, you know, fascination with impressionists because I look at that as my devel development as an artist. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now I was pretty firmly entrenched in loving Salvador Dali because mm. of his incredible ability and the surrealism. Mm -hmm. So. Your art right feels around. very surrealist to me. Right. It, it is. Absolutely. Thank you. I mean, it is yes. probably you. considered, but it, yeah. but it does come across. Thank you. Very much. So. so, so right around this time, I met the man that I married. The adorable Perry. Seven months later. Ten months later. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so with a huge amount of support from Perry, because all of those other really interesting men I was talking well, about their own did artists. not yeah. care at all about what I did. I was the girlfriend. I was the girl. And you didn't care at the time. I didn't you care. Just kind it, of was it was fascinating. Yeah. It, was an, it was a study. It was a Yeah, it was a study. It's, yeah, you're learning. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I can try to impart is you may not pick up a pencil or a paintbrush for 10 years, 
but when you finally do again, you have learned so much in that 10 year period. I so yeah. agree with you. Yeah, we've had lots of talks on the podcast about mm -hmm. you do not yes. have to think yeah. that you've fallen behind no. or that no, you've, you've, lost you've time. been learning. You've been learning. Absolutely. And that doesn't only apply to, you know, painting, it can apply to writing because you're reading and learning oh, how to absolutely. tell a story or the, the, some of the things like instruments where you have to have the technical ability that can be different, but not quite because you can gain an understanding of chords or you can gain an understanding of melody or how to, yeah. you know, so I can pick up the guitar and mm -hmm. play, but mm -hmm. I just, I'm rusty. My you, fingers hurt. Physically you get yeah, rusty. Physically you get rusty. But I think but that you maybe in your that. understanding of yeah. what it is that you want to play or how to listen or how to tell a story mm -hmm. through that medium, I think that we do keep learning and growing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's fascinating. So, so, so a huge impact that I can't take responsibility for at all is my husband. Mm -hmm. I mean that I, I landed, I won the lottery with him mm -hmm. because he, he was incredibly supportive and, you know, never has put any pressure on me whatsoever. So that was huge. The other thing was four years into our being married, I finally decided, okay, I will have this baby and <laughs> and you know limited finances we i'm lock stock and barrel i'm nanny i'm mother i'm everything plus san francisco was not a place where it wasn't like my college friends that got married and had babies and you know they're all on the east coast or no one in san francisco except for two women i knew had children right. so yeah. i was also in a building where Everyone left for work, and so, so you were isolated I, with a child. I had I I was home with that baby, and mm -hmm. it meant that I started painting mm -hmm. during the day because I mean I'm you know my schlepping around with a with a baby it's carriage. Yeah. I mean yeah. So so uh, the birth of Olivia gave me discipline, and oh. it also changed me from being working at two in the morning, three in the morning. That's not happening anymore. Mm -hmm. To being able to use light because to be oh, able to paint the way I that's paint, kind of fascinating. you have that's to have light. Yeah, you love can't that. paint at night. You can't paint in incandescent. That is so interesting. But I love how you talk about how having her gave you discipline, and we've talked about that very much. So. Where you know, in my twenties, I had all this free time and all this creative energy and all this stuff, and it's really now when I have so many responsibilities mm -hmm. that I'm able to be more disciplined. See, and that's our and watchers focused. and listeners who've kind of gone through like but you're you, arriving at maturity. Yeah, and that's when you're. Using Using what seems arrives. to be, and we always talk mm -hmm. about using what seems to be perhaps an obstacle or a mm -hmm. challenge, you know, using it to your advantage, which it sounds like you did do. So that's kind of where you flipped from the you started, amateur Yeah, to you the changed your mindset. Like, oh, oh, I'm going to work during the day. I'm home with a baby and I'm going to use all this wonderful light and learn how to work. I also, it. I also had made a challenge for myself. And this was, you know, in the three or four years before Olivia mm -hmm. was born was I've always loved perfectly done paintings. I would go to the Palace of the Legion of Honor mm. and find those beautiful little Flemish paintings mm. done by God knows who, mm -hmm. and just sit there. The joke was I've always, Perry and I wanted to take one of my perfectly done little paintings, sneak it into the Try museum, to <laughs> and just stick it on the wall with one of their yes. little things and just yes. see how long it would last. Yes. You know, not steal a painting, but no, out of out of it. I mean, I'm kind of seeing a book here, right? <laughs> At least right. a good story. Wouldn't that be fun. So, yeah. so I always wanted to be able to do that. So mm -hmm. I set up a challenge for myself, and at this point, Dolly's mixed in with the perfectly with done the Flemish painters uh -huh. to do it. And if I didn't feel like I did a good job, I would put a paintbrush down because it's really hard to paint an oil when you haven't had the correct instruction, which I figured it out. So it just took me a little bit of time. We'll talk about that in a little bit too. Okay. The, okay. the, the wonderful part of not having actually someone mm -hmm. tell you exactly how to do it. Anyway, um, so that was helpful. And, um, and then having Olivia was hugely helpful. And I also, one thing for a creative process for me, because I did want to be able to make a, a, a life supporting 
career out of this. Right. So you decided to be I, a professional I, as, as artist. As me sort of paying attention to what was going on mm-hmm. around me, I thought the most important thing for me was to focus on one direction. Ah. I didn't want to be doing, you know, I've got a friend who can do, she can paint on ceramic tiles. She went to Germany to learn how to paint on porcelain. She she painted with acrylics. She wanted to, she can do frescoes. She does bathrooms. She does ceilings. Um, and she sort of ended up focusing on painting. I, I don't know if she's still doing acrylic or else she, if she's moved to oil, but I just watched all that hopscotching. I just can't do it. See, we've yeah. often, we've talked about on the show, we've talked about the mm-hmm. multi-passionate creatives or the multi-passionate creative entrepreneurs. And we're kind of like, you know, basically you probably need to focus on one thing until you know success you're doing it well. and that plate spinning in the air and then you can add another plate. You know, right. like get that one thing down. And young me made the mistake of hopping around and doing well, a Well, Calder. I mean, think yeah. about Alexander Calder. I mean, oh, yeah. oh, Picasso. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, they bounced all over the place. I just felt like the only, I needed to get as good as I could. So I, I wanted to get as good as I could because I can probably paint the rest of my life and I won't feel like I have reached the level of, I'm not even going to say their names because I'm not going to reach but that level. I agree yeah. But that. I'm I striving think, for it. Yeah, and oh, when you go deep is- into, you know, because you're thinking, oh, the multi-passionate and you're all over the place. But I think what you realize when you go deep into any focus, that there's a whole underworld. That can be better. There's it's, a whole world out there. I mean, yeah. you're, you, when you learn music, you learn some new chord or new something in music and all of a sudden you realize how much you don't know well and it's that's just striving towards yeah and, to you, strive, it, and it's, it's exciting and we're here to tell you that linda's level is beyond you know what anybody can hope to do in their life but it's great that you still have that well i also picked to do that. the worst way to paint on earth if i had done abstract there's no one that can look at an abstract painting and say, and say it can be improved in this way that, <laughs> yeah. that brush stroke isn't right but mm-hmm. you can look at a painting of mine and if i haven't done the hand correctly if i oh, haven't done yeah. if the eyes are a little off mm-hmm. uh, you know i am i can't not keep after a painting until i get it perfect mm-hmm. in to my abilities mm-hmm. so or, or even to what you're trying to represent because some of your paintings have these interesting kind of surrealistic themes and things will be a little bit deformed or manipulated in a certain way to, you know, express something that you're saying, like some of your monumental. Yeah, I can, I can be a little bit loosey goosey, mm-hmm. but, but mm-hmm. you know, I mean, nobody's going to look but at it's it. Not, intent, it's not, but it's not photorealism. Intent. Exactly. Yeah, it's intentional. It's, it's, right, right, right. right. But it's mm-hmm. meant for That's the... why it's wonderful to, for me to paint a monkey or for me to paint a chambered nautilus well, or something so because nobody's going to say that monkey doesn't this look monkey, like it's a special that, monkey with yeah. a personality. Yeah. Well, yeah. can we talk about some of your paintings that for you represent kind of seminal moments in your career? Like let's talk about specific paintings and we will post them on Insta. We will post them in this video Yeah, and let's discuss specific paintings. Um, uh, before we do that. Okay. Because we're this, this I hope will help people in certain, because you know, everyone gains a lot out of your podcast. Thank you. And, Thank and you, one of the one of the things, the points um, that I wanted to make is when someone asked me how you know how do you get inspiration, and I've got the two quotes, which one was Chuck Close that said, "Inspiration is for amateurs. The rest mm-hmm. of us sit down and get to work." Ah. As professionals sit down and get to work. Uh-huh. I love and that. the other one was was Dorothy Parker saying when somebody said, How do you write? She said, You put your ass in a chair. Right. You know, you just really you do. put your ass in the studio. Yeah. yeah. You do it yes. every day. So mm-hmm. anyway, so go back to what you were Yeah, no, but I'd love to point out that every day, like you do that every day. I mean you have Oh, and then the other the, that's... the other point was when I didn't even realize when I went to college because, of course, I was going to either go to the University of Wisconsin or South Carolina for various reasons. My mother taught there in Wisconsin. Anyway, didn't even realize that there were art schools. Mm-hmm. And pardon me if I step on anyone's toes, but I we find, do that all the time here. Yeah, I find <laughs> this is a very mild conversation yes. compared to some of the stuff we do. I can, I can 
pretty much pick out the people that have gone to those art schools uh -huh. oh. because no one taught me and I still don't know the correct way that over centuries that you have been taught to lay down a sienna or whatever it is mm -hmm. and then you put this over it and then you put that over it and that's how you get your drapery or that's how you get your skin so you tone. figured out what works for you I had to figure yeah. it out mm -hmm. so I I'm sorry for putting my ego up there, but I think that I end up being able to have metaphor with my work, mm -hmm. whereas someone who's gone to those schools, they will paint the two of you and you'll look just like where you're sitting there. Right. And you, the, you'll be beautifully painted. Yeah. But there's not the freedom that you. Yeah. 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 You're so not anyway. picking up the nuance of it. And, and I could see, you know, it makes you kind of think back to the early masters and when they were creating those, um, I don't know, I want to call them protocols because I've been at work all day, but <laughs> doing technology stuff, but when, you know, they had to learn how to do that and figure it out. And they probably and they had, had limited, they probably had limited resources and materials. And, you know, there was, I don't know. I mean, it but kind of makes create, me think right. of that same creative process. It's almost like you but, went through one then, of those. Yeah, but then they would have the schools and they would have their apprentices. Yes. And then if it was in the school of somebody, you could barely tell who in the school of whatever sure. created that painting. So you're losing the originality. But, okay, so I'm I'm working on my own trying to do right. a, 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 one of the Spaniards or Caravaggio, right? right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I'm working with Curascara. What... The, the art world in the 16th century, it was like Hollywood. Mm. They, they, there were sets. I mean, they had studios. huge studios. Yeah. And there were many people working on these things. And mm -hmm. they, had, they had pulley systems to pull people up and have them floating in the mm -hmm. air with wings attached to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was... It a was a, a it was a production, mm -hmm. and and it was. But then again, it was a whole different, you know, technology. I mean, everything has changed since the industrial revolution and yeah. everything else. And, and I would say that back then it was almost like advertising. Like you know, like advertising companies have those kinds of budgets when they're doing an ad or whatever. This was advertisements for God. Was what was happening. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. Yeah, you also had <laughs> advertisements for God. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you also had your, your patronage. Exactly. Who was going to pay the money? It was either going to be the aristocracy, mm -hmm. or it was going to be the Catholic Church. Right, right. So there you go. Yeah, and we, I mean, we've talked about this before. We've just touched on it, and we've had discussions about modern patronages and how they might work and things like Patreon and things like that right. that we're not going to discuss today, but that we will actually, mm -hmm. we had a whole economic, we had a financial consideration show just previously a couple of weeks ago that mm -hmm. you guys should check out. But, you know, how does the modern painter kind of navigate that whole money side of things? And you've been very good, actually, before we talk about your seminal works, because that'll be our conclusion. Can we talk about, you've always valued your art in a very healthy way. I think you've always demanded what it was worth and you know you have collectors who love your stuff myself included um i you know have how many cosgroves do i have I, at least three yeah um and some on loan but uh <laughs> but and i love it and i am you know i love to pay for your work because i believe that it's valuable and amazing and all of your patrons do so how did you learn to value yourself and price your paintings and you know how do you do that because i think a lot of creatives are afraid to ask for their full value you know, you just, it's, it, it is a balancing act. Mm -hmm. So, you know, before Olivia was born, when Evelyn Schreier and I held our, you know, show in her gorgeous penthouse, she's having fun, I'm having fun. Um, you know, the work was detailed and tiny and, and, you know, the sort of the Dali surrealism, but um, you know, it was like eight hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, something like that. Which you were probably thinking, like, this is amazing. Yeah, like that. And yeah. Then, and then it just slowly. Um, I, you, you, you can balance yourself off of what you see other people earning, mm -hmm. also, and also and how what long the market you know, can bear. Yeah, and also what you know you've spent on it because, like. Your time, I think a lot of creatives make the mistake of thinking in terms of materials and they don't value their time. Right. And your paintings take an extremely long time 
to do. And that enters into the cost, I believe, because I mean, it's a whole process. It's no joke. I've narrowed down my audience because my paintings have come to be very expensive at this point. I mean, not, not as, well, as I said today, the $180,000 right, one in the right, back of exactly, the... Exactly, exactly. But um, I'm not there. But yet, um, yet. but <laughs> it also, it has to narrow down because it, I can't knock them out. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a friend that's very successful and he can do 100 paintings in a month. But that, I think that raises their value though, that there's scarcity. Yeah, that, I think it raises their value. It's not everybody's going to be able mm -hmm. to have one. Not everyone can have a cost growth. I'm sorry <laughs> for you. Sorry. To break if it you to want you. them, you can direct message us and yeah. you can follow Linda <laughs> on Instagram as well. Cost Grove Fine Arts, right? Cost, oh, Grove. Five, cost Grove Fine Arts is the website. The website. And your Instagram is Cost Grove Art? I think so, yeah. At Cost Grove Art. <laughs> so. We Listen will to me. connect. We'll put it in the show notes. Don't worry. You'll have the information you need to purchase a Cost Grove or two or yes. three. Um, it's going to happen. Okay, so now let's discuss. Let's go with three seminal works that kind of marked the great movements in your artistic career. Okay. So being in Cali, Colombia with the most incredible woman, um, my husband was there for business. We were also friends with the family and the matriarch was part Italian. Anyway, I, she was so aesthetic and I left there having seen amidst her Luis Barragan designed home and everything simple because she had so many homes everywhere. There were two saints in these gorgeous mm -hmm. frames. Mm -hmm. And this is, I've been married to Perry for a year and I just was like, okay, I'm going home. I've taken photos of these two women in these incredible, I'm not Catholic, I'm not religious. This is all to do with culture. You know, the culture of the Renaissance, the culture of colonial. Yeah, and what was considered culture beautiful of, and important and yeah. So that was huge. So uh -huh. that was one seminal thing. Amazing. Then um And we'll post some pictures of Linda's Saints because And you know, then the other one was traveling to Italy and spending as much time as we have because of my husband husband's business down in Mexico and Colombia. But these trips to Italy and me loving all things Italian and and are also starting to collect. Yes, and if anybody's out there important. is a collector, yeah. you know, especially if you're collecting antiques, if you don't buy it, you're not going to get it and you're ever gonna again. They, they are. It's it's going to be somebody else's. Buyer's remorse, like oh, well, buyer's regret. I mean, like, there's not a second one. No, exactly. It's like, a one off. It, sometimes people are like, oh, buy the bag because you'll. I'm like, you can always find another bag. Yeah, but an antique like that, an object like that, you will never get that back. And you're so right. I mean, it's that, it's really major. Then then an, another major seminal part was um, finding was, myself in New York City. So wait, in, so in Italy, what, which which painting did this give birth to, this uh, this moment in Italy? Um, Actually, Italy, Italy was more affecting everything that we live the around. The surroundings, okay. As opposed to uh -huh. my paintings. Okay. So the, my paintings were more affected by Latin America, oddly enough. Mm -hmm. Then it was the trip to New York with Molly, mm -hmm. where I'm being introduced to a man who was a contemporary of Julian Schnabel's, who they both are still alive. But anyway, you know, he's earning six figures for paintings that you know the painting of his wife is the size of that wall mm -hmm. and I can recognize it as his wife but it is but ugly <laughs> and he he was telling me about his 10 or 11 agents oh, wow. and I knew how much he liked my work because this is back when this is before anybody's sending websites I didn't have a website I had sent him a portfolio of work he called me before he got there talked to me for an hour and a half I knew he was really respectful of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, you know, I've spent three or four days around the guy, gone to his studio, and I'm thinking, he's gonna, out of the 11 agents he's got, maybe he'll find it in his heart to say, I'm gonna contact one agent with you, and he didn't. And he didn't, why? So I wake up in the middle of the night in this hotel, and I'm thinking, 
I don't want to lose my technique. Mm -hmm. I don't want to lose the, the, the style of painting that I love, but I have to do something to reinvent myself. And that's when she I came pivoted. up with, I love it. Yeah. that's when I came up with the negative positive, um, we'll show some the chamber of Nautilus, uh -huh. I think was the very first. And then, uh -huh. and then the other one that you have to show yes. is the, is because I did the love that, that whole there, renaissance, the, the angel that isn't there. The angel's defined the whole by, space. by clothing, by jewelry, the by jewelry, a crown. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. it's negative space. It's it. negative yeah. space. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that. So That's being brilliant. able to do that and was I, very freeing. And oh, it also and I own two of those. Yeah, you do. Yes, and you I also have. affected me. Yes. But this wait a minute, what, what was this I mean, how did you even how did you even come up with that concept? Like lying, where did it come from? Lying in bed just thinking, okay, I love that. I want to be able to do the something beautiful, but okay, I'll do one thing mm -hmm. and then let it so so I've continued on with that now. It's been nineteen years and and, and it's almost like I'm yourself. trying for an abstraction. Mm -hmm. So the the four men, mm -hmm. the it, four elements, the four elements. Yes, we'll post that too. That's incredible. They're, you know, if my idea kind of was okay, you're going to be in another room. You don't mm -hmm. know exactly what these things are, but you see this white thing floating in the, you know, in this mm -hmm. long dark space. And then when you come closer, you start to yeah, realize. and it's on these impossibly thin little little. Um, stocks that signify each of the elements. The other thing that's mm -hmm. difficult about my work is mm -hmm. when it's photographed. When it's, you know, I've got three books now. Um, you can't see the detail. You lose a lot. You with can't that's see difficulty. the humor. Which is, yeah, yeah, I think that's true with all. I, but you know, what I, I mean remember is, seeing some of those paintings in Europe after looking at, you know, the these beautiful art books, mm -hmm. and then getting and seeing the texture and the vibration from the painting and and thinking oh my god it's so much more i can't believe and it may have been way smaller than i thought but mm -hmm. it just it it like grabs you well, the, the reality is the it. texture yeah. is the vibration because she always talks about her i always talk about frequencies vibrations and, vibrations, and vibrations but you have that you do you yeah. get a you get a vibe yeah. off of something and that's why you should buy actual original art yes people. that's if you could afford it buy the original art because you get that feeling from it. Yeah, and it's, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I that's just, fine. I just that. Um, but when I mm -hmm. when I say you can't see it, it's literally you can't see it. I believe because right. because mm -hmm. doing earth, wind, fire, and water. How was I going to represent each man? Mm -hmm. So the stalks that were coming down that were impossible for him for them to be supported on. One has earthworms yeah. and just, insects, yeah. so that's earth. Earth. The other one has little tiny bits of cloth blowing in the wind. Blowing, There's yeah. wind. Very cool. Fire was one of the stalks has a you it's know consumed, a flame coming yeah. up. And then water oh, has kind of dew dripping. drips yeah. coming down. Mm. So it's tiny. It's yeah. little. It's subtle. It's it, subtle. Even if we post we will post a picture, but we defy you to try to see yeah. the details. <laughs> yeah. And I may try to get a detail in there. Maybe I'll even come photograph them before this comes out. But and then yeah. one of the things that you were talking about, and, and I'll try to make this really brief. We were just, my husband, my 28-year-old, and myself were all in Rome, and Olivia had spent a summer there with her university studying art and architecture, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so she had gone to all these incredible, um, you know, to the Vatican, yeah, yeah, yeah. et cetera. So now I have the best tour guide because she she is easily happy to be seven hours on her feet looking from painting to painting to painting to painting. Um, and in the Vatican, the ceiling, mm. I had no idea. And she pointed it out. Michelangelo was given so much grief about all the nudity oh, in I his paintings. Mm -hmm. So the Pope, he had to go back and try to camouflage things. Mm -hmm. So what he did well, what was... What he gladly did, because he was... We, we did the thing on the economics. He was one of the most wealthy yeah. painters of the time. He was actually like, if you converted it to the dollars of today, he had a fortune of at least, you know, $60 million. And I wish Olivia were sitting here explaining it, because mm -hmm. I'm going to do a terrible job of it. <laughs> but she pointed up to... Michelangelo painted himself yes. in there, but skinned alive. I mean, skinned. So it's oh, it's just wow. himself naked wow. Wow. where his head is upside down and that is his penance for having done 
the nudity. I mean, for, if, for, the the advertising, on... for the advertising campaign for the church. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I may have messed it up, but, but those yeah. kinds of things that one, are you aware of that? I wasn't no, aware, I wasn't of, that aware of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew that. That's him. It's amazing. I, yeah, it's amazing. I didn't know that. I knew that he, there was a lot of controversy and he had a lot of stuff. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't, it, um, didn't Irving Stone, I, I feel like I read a book about Michelangelo. Right, he Irving did, Stone yeah, did write Yeah, he something. did. The, um, the something in the something, or something. Yeah, yeah, the something, yeah, the. I don't remember, but yeah, I many we, many we years, a lot. many many years ago, and um, and I remember there was a lot of controversy with the church, and he was constantly going back and forth and struggling. And I think at one point he was going to quit, and then, you know, they had him come back, and you know, they probably negotiated some all kinds of things, clothes on these people, no yeah. doubt. No, he had, he had to camouflage it. Yeah. Like, where's Olivia when I need her? Right. But, anyway. but, but I love that. And I love that your art is just such a part of your life and that your family is all now involved in it. And I like to finish on Michelangelo because I think, honestly, your talent to me is right there. But Oh, here's another. Oh, go on. Go on. Do go on. As a woman artist uh -huh. versus... Man. Ooh, I She's like it. Going. Can, yeah, I like where this yeah, is going. That'll be our I, am, I like it. Uh, uh, okay, I'm going to put myself on a level of people that I think that paint as well as I do. Mm -hmm. And they are total egotistical. You can fill in the two words. We often do. And <laughs> we do. We're on wives, so yeah, we're we're yeah, we The wives explicit. are these little ghosts, the children. You Don't walk exist, into yeah. their home and it is a shrine to, to their art and their talent. And I, I, I I'm looking. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna name names. But you know, I'm in another country. I'm looking at this. I'm listening to this guy, and I'm looking around and I'm thinking. My my priorities are. My husband and child. My my family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The fact I'm a painter and a good one and i'm not i'm not making everyone stop Suffer. and pay attention yeah Suffer. and right. and and it's it's ego and it's arresting and it works i mean yeah. they yeah it, it works for it them. pays off for them yes but i that's can't not, that's i not cannot the way recreate it i uh -huh. can't but I you can't do become, pay a price for that it may pay, pay off price. financially they may have big egos but you do pay a price for yeah. that, I believe. And you you live your life and, you know, live your artistic life, you know, kind of in harmony. We did a show about masculine and feminine creative energy. And I think that you really embody that feminine creative energy where you're creative, you're nurturing, you live kind of this more balanced life. And I think it shows in your work, you know. Of, Somebody used the word humble for me. And I'm, I don't think I'm humble. No, because I you know you're no, I, I don't think I've you're got, humble. I've got I, a strong ego. It's just... You know, you guys, I don't expect you to just like look at me and think, wow, you know. Well, we oh, do, we Linda. We do, Linda. <laughs> Otherwise, but, you wouldn't be here. But yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm putting my, I'm making a parallel yeah. between myself and these men. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, I, I will give them their due. They, you know, they, they managed to create huge studios for themselves. They right. get the apprentices. They right. turn it into a business. They turn it into a business. But I think you're a professional who hasn't turned it into a factory. No. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I, and I think but that know, is the choice. message to, you know, that uh, again, I think a lot of our viewers are women. I think mm -hmm. they are women that are negotiating that husbands balance. Yeah. and households and finances and children and all of those things that you've negotiated. And I guess the message to them is that, you know, they, they can, still be the best at what they want to do creatively and you're living proof of that yes and, and and when if you're a woman and you put yourself out there a little bit too much we we saw something on instagram today uh -huh. where I, uh -huh. this woman that i think is wonderful mm -hmm. it almost becomes comical mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it you're not taken as seriously men can get away with a whole lot more oh yeah still still today but i think that it's a choice that you know our viewers need to be you know conscious of that and are conscious of that no doubt yeah. but i think that it's a choice going forward that i think we'll be able to espouse like a lot more we'll be able to make that decision of how do we want to balance our lives and i think that you've balanced your life in this amazing way 
And I love that we got the opportunity to hear about your process and the journey yeah. and the, the style, whole story. The whole story. And, and I'm sure there's like side stories. Oh my God. Yeah. We can have you, hear, we could have you on. <laughs> there's for, a lot more Chardonnay. To be there's there's a, a lot more Chardonnay. Lot more we have Chardonnay. a lot more Chardonnay well, in our future. I don't have a lot more Chardonnay in my glass. So uh -oh. unfortunately we're going to uh -oh. wrap it up on that. But this was amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Guys, if you have any questions, we're going to have Linda looking at the whole feed on Insta and everything else. You can post them and we will try to answer them to the best of our ability. Don't forget to check her out. Cosgrove Art. Uh, at Cosgrove Art. Well, Cosgrove oh, Fine Art. Kind of, uh, yes. Cosgrove, Cosgrove Fine, Fine Arts, Arts website com. Com and on Instagram. And we will, of course, print that. We'll put it down below and we'll have lots of stories that you guys can see. Some more paintings, mm -hmm. everything else. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Yes. Cheers, Cheers to you. Cheers. Cheers to you. And we will see you next time. Yes to get drunk on the creative possibilities. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.